Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this lesson uh, with the oratory place of prayer book. And uh, the prayer we're going to go ahead and pray to start out is called the Pardon Prayer. It's on page 19, uh, the picture with St. Peter here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love Thee. I beg pardon for all those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love Thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The lesson that we'll be focusing on uh, will be the woman at the well. This is a very rich gospel in which we can really pull a lot about our faith um, of the church. So we'll just go ahead and focus on, on a few things. Um, the, main, the main connection here will be between what we're calling Jacob's well, which uh, that's where the Samaritan woman and Jesus are meeting. This is where the, the conversation uh, that will lead to a conversion takes place. And we're going to make a connection between Jacob's well in Samaria and then um, the true well, Jesus Christ, the living water, that is, um, is the cross, and then born from the side of Christ at the cross, the church, which is the true well, um, the sacrament of salvation for the whole world, which all grace and mercy and truth flow from. So I'll make these kind of connections continually between Jacob's well, found in John chapter 4, and then uh, the crucifixion. So first, we're just going to start with the time of day. When we're looking at this gospel, it says that um, the woman went to the well, and Jesus, who was tired from his journey, stopped at the well at noon. And this is important because uh, noon is the, the, really the, the hottest part of the day, um, afternoon, and this is when you're at the, the, the kind of the pinnacle um, and you don't want to go, it wouldn't be ideal to go gather water at noon. Um, rather, what would happen in those days is the women would go out in the morning, um, in the evening when it was cool, and gather the water. This would also be uh, just more productive so that you would have water for the whole day. If you just went out at noon to gather water, you'd have to keep that water, you know, of course, for, for 24 hours. So, this woman is going out at noon um, for, for a very specific reason. She's an outcast. Uh, she is a person that doesn't fit in with the others. The, the people of her town have um, cast her away and, and marginalized her. So she is an outcast. And because she's an outcast, because the people in the city won't deal with her, um, and so she has to go gather water um, as an outcast, this means that she's alone. She's alone when she meets Jesus. Um, we also notice that Jesus is alone. Uh, most of the time in Scripture when we see that Jesus is alone, maybe he has gone off to pray. But in this case, um, it's, it's the disciples uh, that have gone off to find food and leaving Jesus alone with this woman to speak. So um, the woman is an outcast and she's alone. I want to go ahead and, and now kind of shift to the crucifixion. Uh, when we look at the crucifixion, we, our tradition tells us that Jesus was on the cross from noon to 3 p.m., which is the Divine Mercy Hour. And upon the cross, he speaks to us. Uh, we have a video lesson on the seven last words of Christ, which are really phrases of Christ. And so when Jesus mounts the cross, um, he is speaking to us. And every word means something. Um, every time he breathes, he has to pull up on the nails. He has to push up on the nails on his feet and pull up on the nails in his hand. And he has to get that air in his lungs so that he can speak to us. And think of the conversation that takes place as Jesus is on the cross when he says things like, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When he says things like, it is finished. All the significance of those words. He is speaking to us. And what happens on the cross from noon to three? We see that our Lord, our God, Jesus Christ, he becomes the outcast. He's the one that's called the blasphemer. He's a thief. He's, he's, he's no one. He's stripped of everything, and he's placed on a cross like a common thief. Um, St. Paul will say that he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. This is why he can grasp, he can call out, feeling the sins of all humanity, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So on the cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, becomes the outcast. 
Not only is he an outcast, but just like the woman, he has to go to the outskirts of the town because Calvary was on the outskirts of Jerusalem. He has to go out and he's alone. No one else is there. So not only is it significant that the time is the same, um, but it's also significant that this, um, this solitude, right, this, this aloneness, because all of the apostles, except for St. John, would abandon him. Um, Judas would betray him. Peter would deny him. His mother is there. Mary Magdalene is there. St. John is there. But he is alone on that cross. So we have Jesus, the outcast, and Jesus, who is alone. We have this conversation that then takes place. Um, this is, this is the um, Jacob's, what we call Jacob's well. And this, of course, is the crucifix, the cross. Kind of return back to those words and their meaning. Um, but look at, let's look right now at the conversation because the connection between these two events, between Jacob's well and John 4 and then the crucifixion, is that there's a conversation that takes place. In the midst of the um, aloneness, in the midst of uh, the being stripped away and, and being vulnerable, there's a conversation that takes place between Christ, the lover of souls, and the soul that he wishes to speak to. In this case, he's speaking to a woman. And the first thing that he says is, give me a drink. And we notice as we read through the gospel, um, one of the reflections uh, as we went through this, the Lexio Divina this week, is uh, one of the gentlemen said that the interesting thing is he never gets a drink. Um, there is never a time where he, is, he, he actually gets the drink that he asked for. But that's the whole point. He's not asking for water. He is asking for her soul. The drink that will satisfy him is the soul. And I think he even reiterates this, or even maybe you could say explains, expands a little bit, expands on this a little bit more when he says, if his drink is this woman's soul, what he really thirsts for, in other words, is our soul. The soul of each individual person. What is he hungry for? Well, he says, my food, my drink is souls. My food is is the will of God, the will of the Father. He thirsts for souls and he hungers for his Father's will. And wouldn't it be great, you know, I, I know a lot of times uh, I'm, I get busy during my day and I don't eat, eat when I should eat. Maybe I eat a very small breakfast and I skip through lunch and then I realize it's four o'clock and I have barely even eaten that day. Well, typically what happens to me when that happens, when I have one of those days, is I'll get a really bad headache. So around 3.30 or 4 o'clock, I'll get this really bad headache, I'll start feeling fatigue, and I'll realize, because my body is telling me, I must eat. Wouldn't it be great that if our soul would act the same way? Let's say we don't pray in the morning, and we just get really, really busy, and we, we forget to even mentally lift up our mind and our heart to God. We forget to offer our daily actions to God. And so we get around 3 o'clock, 3.30, 4 o'clock, and what if our soul just had a migraine headache? If our soul just said, I need the Father's will. I need to pay attention to the Father's will. That would be a great thing. And I think to some part, you know, our souls are active like that. But we have to awaken that in our souls. Um, our bodies do that naturally because our bodies um, have to tell us certain things for us to continue to live. In the same way, we have to ask for the grace that our soul will speak to us, that we alive in the interior life so that our interior life will be um, able to tell us what it needs to continue to go. We have to ask for the grace to do that. So um, as, we, as we move on, Jesus says, give me a drink, which, which is really he is thirsty for the soul and he, he awakens in the woman that she is truly thirsty for him. And so there's this conversation that starts, and, and we'll see where that goes. On this side, on the cross, what we see is that he says, I thirst. This is one of the seven phrases that Jesus says. And once again, what is he thirsty for? He's thirsty for souls. At, the, at Jacob's well, he is speaking to one single soul. 
And, and what is it that he, as, as we go a little bit farther, this is such an honor um, that this woman has. Um, if we look at Jesus, this is John chapter 4. If we look at, at John chapter 1 through 4, we see that Jesus, um, he, he's always revealing his divinity. But he, he kind of does it in a subtle way, John 1, 2, and 3. And then in 4, he says something. I want to look at um, what he says to this woman. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. Messiah in, in the Hebrew is the anointed one. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. Christ in Greek is the anointed one. When he comes, he will tell us everything. The woman is making this explanation because as the conversation gets deeper in, she realizes there is something to this man that is speaking to her. And she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. This is right after Jesus has just told her intimate things about her life. Um, at this, Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. So he reveals to her, he says, I am he. It kind of reminds us a little bit of the first time that God had revealed his name. Uh, when, when he spoke to Moses um, in the desert, the burning bush, um, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am. And, and so this is the first time that Jesus, at least in John's gospel, says directly, without any type of metaphor, without any type of um, you know, symbolism, he just directly says, I am he, the one that you're saying, the Christ, the Messiah. What an honor that the first time he reveals himself is to a woman, a Samaritan, an outcast, and indeed a sinner. She is not living, um, and she knows that. She, uh, it says that she has had five husbands, and the, one, the man that she is with now is not her husband. She is living a life that is separated from the community. Um, she is also living a life of, of sin. Um, and, and she is, in, in every case, she would be the most likely person uh, to be a follower of Christ, to be considered as a follower of Christ, to be considered as a disciple. Yet it's this person that Jesus reveals himself to, reveals who he is, the Messiah, the Christ. Um, in a similar way, it's very interesting on the cross where, where we look upon an outcast. We look upon... Um, someone that has outcast, someone that has emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave rather than the son of God. And it's the, it's, the, it's the Roman centurion that says, truly, this is the son of God. As Jesus makes himself vulnerable, as Jesus reveals himself, we understand as he strips himself in his humility, we see the beauty of his divinity. Um, so we move, we move a little bit here. He's talking to this, this woman, the Samaritan, the outcast, the sinner. He cares and he thirsts for this soul. That is the reason he is on this journey. That is the reason he stops. That's the reason he's thirsty. It all reveals around a soul, one soul. Now, when he's on the cross, when he says, I thirst, he is not saying, I thirst for a, a communal sense of the soul, but each individual soul. You've probably heard, and I've heard many times, that Jesus would have just died if it was only us. Just one soul, just my soul, he still would have died. And that's true because right here what he is doing is having a conversation with each individual soul. Just as at the well he had a conversation with one woman, here on the cross and from the cross, he is having a conversation with you and a conversation with me, a conversation with the soul. St. Bonaventure, uh, who, who was a great theologian, a great teacher, um, he, he taught in the university, um, and, and one time someone said, what is your favorite book? And he pointed to a cross, and he said, he pointed to a crucifix, and he said, that is my book. And, and each one of us, each soul has access to the cross. We have this access at the Mass, uh, most importantly, most especially at the Mass. And it's at the Mass that uh, Jesus Christ comes to us, the cross comes to us, 
and, and we can actually have this deep conversation with Jesus one-on-one, um, -on -one, just as this woman did. And we can have a conversion. We who are the outcast because of our sin, um, we who find ourselves so alone can come to the well of Jesus Christ, can come to the cross and have a conversation. Now we don't know, uh, you know, we don't know how long this conversation took. We know that it started around noon, but we don't know if it took three hours, four hours, five hours. We do know that the apostles came back um, and that they're wondering about food and things like this and wondering why Jesus is speaking to this woman, but we don't know how long. We do know that this conversation is from noon to three. Three hours of agony in which Jesus is speaking to us and we can speak to him. And the same conversation is going on where Jesus says, I thirst for your soul. I have everything to offer you. Come to me. Um, I want to look a little bit at, at what it is, um, look a little deeper into the conversation and, and what it is that um, Jesus promises this woman. So, the woman said to him, Sir, uh, well, Jesus says, uh, give me a drink. And, if, and, and then the response is, um, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So Jesus says that, that there's this thing called living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? So this, this idea of living water piques her interest. Are you greater than, the fa than our father Jacob, who gave us this cistern and drank from it himself and his children and his flocks? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I want to go ahead and focus a little bit on those words. So at Jacob's well, um, there's this water. And he says, um, everyone that drinks this water will thirst. Thirst again. But, whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. And then he says, even that water will, will well up to eternal life. So he promises a water that will give eternal life. And, and just as, um, he, he basically says, I will give you this water. So, I, this is the promise that he makes is, I will give, in a sense, living water or eternal water. But the question is really, how? Because in this moment, he do, he's not giving her any water. There's no exchange of a water. There's just this deep conversation um, that goes deeper and more intimate into her life. And then eventually, she goes back into the town um, where she's an outcast. She goes back into the town and tells everyone that she has found the Christ. Could he be the Christ is what she says. So how is he going to give this water? How is that going to happen? And when we look to the cross, we see that this, this question is going to be answered at the cross. Because when Jesus goes on the cross... We're going to see that, that from his side um, comes this water. Now, if we look at the reading for the, the third Sunday of Lent, when we look at the Old Testament reading, it's the reading of, of Moses and the Israelites in the desert. And they're thirsty, they're wandering the desert, and, and, they, and Moses has to do something for them. So he asks God, what should I do? And God says, I want you to take the staff that you put into the Red Sea to split the water. I want you to take the staff and I want you to strike the rock. And he strikes the rock and water flows out of the rock and the people are saved. 
But once again, they drink that water and eventually they will die, just like Jacob's well. They drink this water and they will eventually die. They will eventually thirst and that water cannot satisfy, only temporarily, not eternally, which is what Jesus is offering. So we call Jesus, one of his titles is the cornerstone. And so what happens at the cross is the, co the cornerstone, our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross, they take the sphere and they pierce the cornerstone. They hit the cornerstone and from his side flows blood and water. So I will give eternal life. Jesus promises this. To the woman, he promises it to us. He says, the water that I have will well up to eternal life. But he doesn't give it to her at this well. Because it's not at this well. What he's going to do is he's going to give this water at the cross. And that's important because Jacob's well is just a type. It's just a, a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of the cross. Because at the cross spilling forth from the side of Christ, this blood and this water is where the, where the church is born, and the church is the well. The church is the sacrament of salvation for the whole world, which, which from the church is giving all of this grace, this water, this grace, this mercy, this truth. Um, now, when we look at Jacob, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and, and the church has always referred to, the church is always referred to the new Israel. So if we follow that kind of line of logic, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, okay? Jacob being translated, then being changed to Israel. What is Israel's well? What is Jacob's well? Well, that's the church. So the church is the well of salvation. From Jacob's well comes a temporal water. From the church's well comes an eternal spring. And this spring is offered to the whole world, flowing from the precious wound in the side of Jesus. Um, now, I want to look at one more promise that is given um, a little bit shortly after. This is all in John 4. But we look in John 6, which is very familiar to us, and we see that, that Jesus makes another promise a little bit later. And he says, once again, he uses kind of the same pattern he does with the woman. He tells the woman, your ancestors and you can drink from this water, but you're going to be thirsty again. But I will give you water that is eternal. I will give you water that, that leads to life eternal. Again, in John 6, he says to, to all the people that are there, he says, Your ancestors ate manna in the desert. Your ancestors drank, you will drink, you will be thirsty. Your ancestors ate manna, and they, they died. The manna only lasted temporal time, and then they died. But I... I will give, or I am, the bread from heaven. So, I am and I will give bread from heaven. And then he takes it a little bit farther. He's not just keeping it as, as like a symbol. Of course, this symbol of water is actually realized in the water that comes from his side. But in this case, he doesn't just say, I'm going to give you some bread, like in a symbolic way. But he actually says, unless you eat my flesh. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life within you. Once again, this eternal life. I will give you water for eternal life. I will give you my flesh and my blood for eternal life. The end is the eternal life of our soul. That we can share and partake in his divine nature in this eternal exchange of love for all eternity. That's the goal. Um, so, just as he says, I will give, or I shall give eternal life, eternal water, living water, he says, I shall give my body, 
my flesh. There's another question here. And the question is, how, when, when and how is he going to give me water? That's what the woman's saying. And the, and the disciples, the people that hear this, when and how? When and how? How is he going to give us his flesh? This doesn't make sense. And many people leave. How will this man give us his flesh? Now, there's, there, there's, there are some disciples, of course, the apostles, the ones that are very close to him, that do believe this. And they say, you know what, I'm just going to trust him. So when we look, we see that this question is answered at the cross. Where is this question answered? This question is answered at the Last Supper. When the apostles sit down at the Last Supper, and Jesus takes bread in his hand, and he says, This is my body. When he says that, this question has just been answered. So, when does he give us his flesh? He gives it to us at the Last Supper. This is my body. How will we eat his flesh? We will eat his flesh in the Eucharist. Um, how will we drink his blood? His blood is given right here. So we have always seen from the side the church is born, so the church is the well, and we have always seen this blood to mean the Eucharist. The blood flowing from his side is the sacrament of the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament. The, 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 the water flowing from his side is baptism. These two sacraments are, are our way to this, his sacred heart. Um, when he says, you know, right before this verse, this is John 4, in John 3, he's going to say to Nicodemus, he'll say, you must be born again. Okay, he must be born again. Baptism. He says about baptism, and then he says, I will give you this water. All of that is leading to this moment on the cross when he, when he, um, when he dies for us to give us this grace. This moment is leading also to the cross. Now, when we look at the Last Supper, which happens on Holy Thursday, that's coming up pretty soon, and then we see the cross, which happens on Good Friday. The, the tritium of the church, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, the Easter Vigil and then Easter Sunday, all of those together. When we see Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, this tritium is, this tritium is, is one liturgy. Just as the Last Supper and the cross are, are one event in which he is giving his body to us, giving these graces to us, the same thing is true liturgically of, of the tritium. Um, now, just a little bit of a side on this, too. When we, when we look at the importance of the church as the true and fulfillment of Jacob's well, we also understand a little bit of what Jesus talks about then on how we should worship. Because he says to her, um, he says, You people, let's see, go a little bit farther. Your an our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you people say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. So there's also this, this fighting between the Jew and the Samaritan. Um, the Samaritans worshiping on this mountain, the sacred mountain, and, and the Jews worshiping um, in Jerusalem. Well, what is so big about Jerusalem? What's big about Jerusalem is the temple is there. And so worship is centered around the temple. When Jesus says, um, and he will say this in John chapter 2, he'll say, um, destroy this temple, and he's speaking of his body, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in, on the third day. And this is obviously his, his passion, his death, his resurrection. The temple was destroyed, and Jesus predict, predicted, predicted that it would be destroyed. Um, and the temple has never again um, been able to be built. People have tried, it has never worked. And so to this day, almost 2,000 years later, no one has rebuilt the temple. There's a reason for that. Because Jesus is the temple. So when we talk about Jacob's well and then the church, which gives the springs of eternal life, we also know that on this cross, Jesus' body that hung on this cross, is 
is the temple. His body is the temple. There's no longer a need to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and there's no longer a need to worship on the mountain. And so going back to what Jesus says, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. There's no need to worship, in a sense, what your ancestors had, and there's no need to worship in, in Jerusalem where the temple is, because Jesus Christ is the temple. His body is the temple. That's what worship in spirit and truth is. When we not only worship the temple, but we receive the body, which is the temple. And where is this temple Jesus Christ found? This temple Jesus Christ is found in every single tabernacle all over the world. And so let us worship the living God and let us understand that he wants to have a conversation with us that he wants he cares for our soul he wants our soul to have eternal life and so he gives us that water he gives us that water through baptism and living out our baptism and continuing to live out our baptismal vows from his side where does he give us his flesh he gives us his flesh again from the cross the sacrifice the holy sacrifice of the mass and, and he wants to have this conversation with us. Um, and, and we pray for always the grace to, to come to the cross and to enter into this conversation. If we are willing to enter into this conversation, the same thing will happen to us that happened to the woman. Remember, at the end of this, at the end of this story, the woman goes into town and she leaves the jar. She is no longer concerned about the jar and the water from the well. It's no longer a concern because she now has a new water, a living water, and she leaves her jar. She leaves the desires that she used to have. She leaves her life of sin. She leaves her old life and she goes into the town where no one likes her and she tells them about Jesus Christ, this, this Messiah, the, the Christ, she shares her new life that she has found and she evangelizes. She's been catechized by Jesus and now she goes and she evangelizes to others. And, and we can do the same. We, we come to the cross. We, we encounter Jesus Christ in his conversation. And that will lead to a conversion in our life. And we will leave that jar there. It doesn't matter anymore. There's so much, there's, there's a newness now to my life. There's a newness now to what Christ has given me. Let us pray for those graces to, to um, really have that eternal life living within our soul and welling up um, so that we can share that also with others. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.